university, and uh, he just is completing his junior year. He will be joining us this summer in just two weeks to serve as our preaching intern. We haven't had one of these until like 2015 with, or 14 with some random kid um, named Ben Hogan. And so we're excited to bring back the preaching intern. He's going to be working both with me and, and Ben Hogan directly. And you'll see him teaching classes, preaching occasionally. But the, the BYG gets introduced to their interns at, earlier. They got introduced to their interns earlier in the year. And we haven't introduced you to the preaching intern yet. So I want to make you aware of Sawyer Reed. He'll be joining us in about two weeks along with our uh, BYG intern. So it's, we're hoping for a great summer. And you'll see him around and, and uh, working in a variety of capacities. So just to be aware of him. With that being said, I do want to turn, turn our attention to our lesson for today. But I want to start by telling you a story. There was a young man who was engaged to be married, and he asked his father for some advice. He asked his father specifically for advice on how to have a long and happy marriage. And he said, Dad, you and Mom have been happily married for 28 years now. How do you do it? And his dad said, well, that's easy, son. When your mom and I got married, we made a deal. She would make all the little decisions, and I would make all the big decisions. And the son said, well, that, that sounds like a good arrangement. But how do you decide what's a big decision and what's a little decision? And his dad said, oh, there haven't been any big decisions yet. <laughs> You know, we all face decisions. We all have choices to make. And there are some choices that you get to make, but there are also some that you don't get to make. Some that are essentially made for you. And this morning, as the uh, uh, seniors are celebrated and honored and recognized, I want to take a look at a story in the Bible about someone who was young. It's the story of Daniel. Daniel is one of the Bible's most well-known young people. In fact, Daniel chapter 1 and verse 4 indicates that Daniel's story starts when he was a youth. And one thing we'll talk about more in just a minute is the fact that Daniel was taken from his home in Israel to undergo training in Babylon. History indicates that the education of Persian youths began at age 14 and was completed at age 17. Now, we're dealing with Babylon, not Persia, so the age of such an education may be different. But the fact that Daniel lived through the entire exilic period, which spanned 70 years, seems to support that age range of him being a teenager when his story began. And the reason we're looking at Daniel's life is so that we can see which choices he got to make in which choices he did not get to make. And in looking at his choices, we're able to prepare ourselves to make the same choices one day. So let's start with the choices that we don't get to make. Look at Daniel chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. There we're told that in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with, with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youth without blemish, of good appearance, skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. 
What we find out at the beginning of Daniel's story is that there are some decisions he did not get to make. And one of those is his circumstances. See, you do not get to choose your circumstances all the time. Think about Daniel for a moment. At the outset of his story, we learn that he was taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar after the Babylonians conquered the city of Jerusalem. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was a fairly wise individual. You see, in that day and age, a lot of kings would go in, take over a nation, and just obliterate its people. But Nebuchadnezzar was different. Nebuchadnezzar decided instead of just annihilating everyone or making everyone my slave, I'm going to assemble the most educated, the healthiest, the most attractive, and bring them back to Babylon, and I'm going to educate them. Nebuchadnezzar, as one commentator pointed out, was more intent on incorporation of captive peoples into Babylonian society than he was on genocide. See, his idea was this. If he took the best people of the conquered lands and brought them back, he could educate them in his culture and in his worldview, and then they become assets for him. He could benefit from their contributions, from their intelligence, from their experiences, but he could also benefit from sending them back to the conquered peoples to convince the conquered peoples to follow him. Nebuchadnezzar was ahead of his time, and he had this whole training program like a graduate school for these people he brought back to Babylon. See, once they arrived in Babylon, they would enter that three-year educational program. They would be provided with a place to stay. They would be provided with food to eat. Not just any food. They would be provided with the same kind of food the king ate. So they had room and board. And I can imagine that some of these guys are celebrating the fact that instead of existing as captives back in their home country, they're getting prince-like treatment in the king's palace. I bet some of them are like, look, we lucked out. This is awesome. This is the best you could ask for. We're living in luxury. And that kind of treatment would easily make one like captivity. It would make one soften to the idea of accepting a cultural shift. And that's the experience that Daniel finds himself in. Think about it this way. Daniel did not get to choose whether or not he left Israel. Daniel did not get to choose whether or not he relocated to Babylon. Daniel did not get to choose whether or not he entered Nebuchadnezzar's training program. Daniel did not get to choose these circumstances in which he found himself as a young man. And we don't always get to choose our circumstances. We don't always get to choose what we're going to go through. For some of us, we didn't get to choose whether or not our parents stayed together. We didn't get to choose whether or not we lost our job. We didn't get to choose whether or not we received that diagnosis. And we didn't get to choose whether or not our loved one passed away. There are circumstances that you're never going to have a say in. There are circumstances you're going to face that you did not choose. Because you do not always get to choose your circumstances. But that's not the only thing you don't get to choose. The other thing you don't get to choose is your background. 
Did you notice that Daniel is selected to be a part of the Babylonian training program because of factors beyond his control? Notice again the qualifications for those Nebuchadnezzar selected. They must be a member of the upper class. The text specifically says of the royal family or of nobility. So you had to be upper class in some category. They had to be attractive. Nebuchadnezzar specified that they must be without blemish and of good appearance. And they must be intelligent. It says they must be skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, able to learn the literature and language of the Chaldeans. Needless to say, based on those categories, I would have been safe. But Daniel wasn't. Daniel met all the qualifications. He was from an upper class family. He was physically attractive. He was highly intelligent. But but before you get jealous of Daniel's advantages, you have to remember it's precisely those qualities that caused him to be taken captive by a foreign military force. And the point is that we don't get to choose our background. We don't get to choose certain aspects of who we are. Regardless of whether or not your background consists of qualities that the world deems advantageous or if it consists of qualities that the world deems unfortunate, you didn't get to choose them. Daniel did not get to choose his family of origin. Daniel did not get to choose his physical traits. Daniel did not get to choose his mental faculties. And the same is true for you and I. We don't get to choose what family we are born into or what family we're adopted into. We don't get to choose our physical appearance We don't get to choose our genetics, our DNA code. We don't get to choose our ethnicity. We don't get to choose our race. We don't get to choose all of these biological factors that make up who we are. Just like Daniel did. You don't get to choose your socioeconomic level as a child. You don't get to choose the neighborhood or city or state or country in which you are raised. But none of those factors, though not chosen by you, none of them dictate your worth. None of them dictate whether or not you will be loved by God. None of them dictate whether you'll be useful to God. None of them dictate whether you will be saved by God. Your background is not decided by you, but neither does your background define you. You don't get to choose your background. But your background doesn't get to define who you are. So if you don't get to choose your circumstances and you don't get to choose your background, what do you get to choose? Well, that's where the story of Daniel becomes so very important. Because when we look at Daniel's story, we will find out two important things that Daniel got to choose and that we get to choose. And it starts by looking at verse 7 of Daniel chapter 1. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. And what we learn from that simple verse is that you do get to choose your identity. Now, I know you're sitting there thinking, wait, they changed Daniel's name. They changed Hananiah's name. They changed Mishael's name, and they changed Azariah's name. How is that getting to choose their identity? Well, you have to remember that in this age and time, names meant something. 
There was a reason their names were being changed, and it's because all of their names declared something about Yahweh, about the God they worshipped in Israel. And what Nebuchadnezzar has happened is that as part of this training program to get them to adopt the culture and worldview of Babylon, he gives them new names that align with the deities of Babylon. See, Daniel's name means God is my judge. And that name got changed to Belteshazzar, which means Bel protect his life. And Bel was the chief god of the Babylonians, also known as Marduk. Hananiah's name means Yahweh is gracious, and his name was changed to Shadrach, which means the command of Aku. Aku was the name of the Babylonian moon god. Mishael's name meant who is what God is. And his name got changed to Meshach, which means who is what Aku is. Again, a reference to the Babylonian moon god. Azariah's name meant Yahweh has helped. And his name was changed to Abednego, which means servant of Nabu. Nabu was the son of the Babylonian god Marduk. And what I find interesting about these name changes, particularly about Daniel's name change, is that his Hebrew name, the name Daniel, is used seven times more often in the book than Belteshazzar, his Babylonian name. The name Daniel appears 75 times in this book. Belteshazzar only appears 10 times. And those 10 instances when the Babylonian name Belteshazzar is used, they are either an explanation that he was given this name or a quotation from a Babylonian figure. Why does that matter? It matters because we find out in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4 that Daniel is the author of the book. That Daniel is the one who wrote these words. And it's fascinating to me because Daniel made an intentional choice to prioritize his Hebrew name, his name declaring glory to Yahweh rather than his Babylonian name. How many of you are familiar with Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah? Raise your hand. How many of you are familiar with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Yeah. How many of you are familiar with Belteshazzar? And how many of you are familiar with Daniel? Daniel chose the identity that he wanted to be remembered by. He chose to have an identity forever cemented in the minds of his readers that associated him with Yahweh. He chose to have an identity connecting him with his God, with the Lord God. He chose the identity that he wanted to retain for the rest of his life. That's a choice you get to make. See, our identity impacts our thoughts, our attitudes, and our behaviors. And Daniel understood this. That's why Daniel maintained his identity in association with Yahweh, even though the world around him tried to change that identity. In other words, Daniel wasn't going to be who the world wanted him to be. He was going to be who God called him to be. What about you? That decision lies before you each and every day. Are you going to maintain the identity of of, of the identity by which God has called you to have, or are you going to adopt the identity that the world wants to place on you? That's a choice you get to make each and every day. And to our young people, and especially those graduates who may be moving away from home, who are transitioning into a new phase of life, your identity is going to matter. And you're going to have to make the choice of what it will be. You get to choose your identity. But there is one more choice you're going to get to make. And we see it here in the last half of Daniel chapter 1, beginning in verse 8. But Daniel, 
Not Belteshazzar, Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has signed your food and your drink. For why? Why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are on who are of your own age. So would you endanger my head with the king? Then Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned, over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you. And deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. See, I think Daniel recognized what was happening. I think Daniel grasped this whole training program. I think he understood that what they were ultimately trying to accomplish was to strip him and his friends of their spiritual identity with Yahweh, of their cultural identity as Israelites, and place on them Babylonian identities, Babylonian cultural expectations. They wanted them, by the end of the day, to be thoroughly Babylonian remedied of their Hebraic past. And I think Daniel decided it was time to take a stand. See, Daniel chose his boundary. Daniel made a decision about how far he was willing to go down this path of influence. And he chose to take his stand right here when it came to food. Notice the text says that he resolved not to defile himself. He decided that his purity was at risk. And he was making the choice to draw the line in the sand. Now how would the king's food defile Daniel? Why this? Why Take a stand here. Well, there's a few potential options. It may have been that Daniel did not want to eat the king's food because he did not know if it was kosher according to Jewish dietary laws. You can go to Leviticus chapter 11, Deuteronomy chapter 12, and read the dietary laws of the Jews. You know, there are certain things they could eat because it was deemed clean. And there were certain things they could not eat because it was deemed unclean. Maybe Daniel wanted to remain committed to those those laws, and not defile himself. In fact, the, the, the term defile that appears in this verse denotes religious defilement. So maybe Daniel just wanted to stay kosher. But we don't know if there was an issue with clean and unclean food here. That's not specified. So it could be also that Daniel did not want to eat the king's food because it had been offered to the Babylonian gods first, and therefore eating it would have been associated with idolatrous worship. You may recall in the New Testament how Paul had to address the issue of eating food sacrificed to idols, and how some, particularly Jewish Christians, took offense to that, took offense to anyone who ate food sacrificed to idols. Because to them, that was the equivalent of worshiping the God to whom the food was sacrificed. There's no mention of the food being sacrificed before it was served to Daniel. It's a possibility, but it's not a guarantee. Maybe Daniel did not want to eat the king's food because eating it would have been tantamount to entering into a covenant relationship with him. One commentator points out that the idiom to eat at the king's table means to eat food from the king's provision as an acceptance of a covenant or a treaty with him. And therefore, by refusing 
to eat that food, that food provided by the king, Daniel is refusing to be in relationship with the king. But Daniel didn't do this publicly, so who's witnessing his stance in that regard? There's a fourth possibility. And it may be that Daniel did not want to eat the king's food because he wanted to demonstrate his faith in God. You know, Daniel and his friends are in the process of being educated in this program, and their minds and their bodies are being fed by the Babylonians. So if they prosper, if they're successful, if they grow, who gets credit for it? The Babylonians. Maybe what Daniel's trying to do is to show the king and to show his court that they're not sustained by them, that the glory doesn't go to them, that the glory goes to Yahweh. We don't know the exact reason Daniel chose his boundary, but what we do know is that he chose one. He said, enough is enough. He said, this is as far as I will go. I will not allow myself to be compromised any further. He chose a boundary. And that decision had long-lasting implications. Because they drew that line in the sand, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they were able to say no in order to commit idolatry by bowing down and worshiping a golden image. And they had the courage to go into a fiery furnace without knowing whether or not the Lord would spare them. And because he drew a line in the sand here, Daniel was able to say no when a law was passed prohibiting him from praying to anyone other than King Darius, even though it meant he would be thrown into a den of lions. You see, when you choose your boundary, you're choosing the place where you'll not compromise any further. And you're saying, I don't care what happens beyond this. I'm not going there. And when you choose your boundary, you set yourself up for spiritual success down the road. You get to choose your boundary. But be sure to choose the one that God set. Because if you choose a lesser boundary marker, You compromise yourself. And you don't necessarily stay within the will of God. To our graduating seniors, once you step outside the boundaries of your parents' household, the boundaries of this congregation, the boundaries of the BYG, whatever boundaries you want to choose, You get to start establishing your own set of boundaries. You get to decide how far you'll go, what you'll do and what you won't do. Once you're outside of the rule of your parents' household or the the leadership of the elders or whoever it might be in the congregation, you're going to get to start establishing your own set of boundaries. Be sure to choose boundaries that keep you in the realm of God's will. Because you don't want to be outside that. See, it's all about what you get to choose and what you don't get to choose. And the choices you do get to make are the ones that will determine your eternity. So make sure to make the right choices. And realize this, that one choice can make a tremendous difference. In 2004, Ukraine was experiencing a a highly charged political atmosphere. Just to set some context, there was voter intimidation happening. And there was even the poisoning of one of the candidates. 
It was their fourth presidential election since they gained their independence from the Soviet Union. And the election came down to two individuals, both named Victor. There was Victor Yanukovych. He was the incumbent prime minister. And then there was the opposition, Victor Yashchenko. During the first round of elections, both candidates had received 39% of the vote in a field of more than 25 candidates. But a winner necessitated 50% or more of the vote, so there was a runoff schedule. On the day of the election, the reigning party, which Viktor Yanukovych was a part of, the incumbent was a part of, they tampered with election results to ensure victory. In fact, they ran the, the television station. They were in charge of the media. And so they announced that the incumbent had won, even though he didn't. And the media refused to challenge them. So on the screen right now, you have a picture of the results. With a deaf interpreter in the bottom corner of the screen. That interpreter's name was Natalia Dimitruk. And as the news presented the reigning regime's message that the incumbent had won and the opposition was defeated, she knew the truth. And she knew that people in the media organization were not telling it. So she refused to translate what was given to her. She signed the following message instead. I am addressing everybody who is deaf in the Ukraine. Our president is Viktor Yashchenko. Do not trust the results of the Central Election Committee. They are all lies. And the deaf community sprang into action. They began messaging their friends about the fraudulent results being reported, and the media networks decided to stop reporting what the state agencies were force-feeding them. And over the following weeks, the Orange Revolution occurred as a million people wearing orange made their way to the capital of Kiev demanding a new election. And the widespread protests led to the Ukraine Supreme Court declaring the election invalid. And in a court-ordered new election a month later, the incumbent lost, and the opposition won, with Viktor Yushchenko becoming the new prime minister. One choice. One choice saying, this is as far as I'll go. I won't go any further. One choice determining boundary. One choice can make a difference. One choice even led to a revolution. You have choices. You get to choose your identity. You get to choose your boundary. And God's word has given us the information we need to make the right choice. That's why we read 2 Timothy chapter 3 at the outset. Where Paul writes to his young protege and says, Remember what you've been taught since you were young. Remember those sacred scriptures that are able to train you, to teach you. And choose wisely. That's the ultimate message. Choose wisely. This morning, if you need to make some choices, we invite you to do so. We extend the invitation for you to make the decision to put on Christ in baptism if you haven't already, so that your sins can be washed away. We invite you to choose to come back to God if you are a child of his that has wandered away. We invite you to come share your struggles with us if you need prayer for what's going on in your life. We invite you to choose to let it be known whatever need you may have at this time while together we 